Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and I am super excited to bring this interview with Sergio Menchaca. He is with Texas Sage Forge, a knife producer. If you go to his Instagram, it's Menchaca Sensei, and we'll get into why it's called Menchaca Sensei. You can see his knives, and they are gorgeous, and they're ugly in as much as what he says they're ugly, but they're ugly, beautiful. They're gorgeous <laughs> knives. They're amazing. And I just wanted to talk about the process because not only is he creating these amazing knives, but he's a principal at Bowie High School. <laughs> and he's an educator and he's multifaceted and he's getting even higher education he's he's growing and learning and if you're listening to this on the podcast i would jump over to the youtube side when you get a chance at youtube.com slash kevin's bbq joints because at the end of this i'm going to have production and his facility and like how he does things and his anvils and his tools and supplies and how he sharpens the knives one thing that he talks about in his videos is how he uses texas products texas wood Texas steel, everything from the earth is important. He loves Texas. He's passionate about Texas, passionate about North Texas. And that comes across in this interview. He's outside, behind him are some beautiful oak trees, super positive guy, super passionate about this craft. And I get kind of nerdy because I've never made knives before and I'm curious about it. So I ask him a bunch of questions that could be dumb questions to you. They weren't dumb questions to me. You learn a lot about knife making his skills, how he got into it, how you get into knife making. And there's a lot more. It's, it's an hour interview. I can't thank Sergio enough for taking the time. I'm also going to put out a second companion video, which shows him making a knife and that knife he and I are giving away. We're gonna have a contest pretty soon within a week or so. So that is super cool. So you get to see the knife that you can possibly win. It's just an awesome story. Killer guy. I know you're really going to enjoy this. And the Kevin's Barbecue Joints podcast and YouTube show is brought to you by as always, Centex Smokers. They're out of Luling, Texas. It's Centex underscore Smokers. Give them a follow. Beautiful stuff. Continues to put out amazing product. You can do almost anything. Give him a DM. Get a quote. He's about four to five months. It could be growing eventually because he's becoming really popular. Again, that's Centex underscore Smokers. And I have a website at kevinsbbqjoints.com. If you're digging these, please subscribe. Make a comment below. Let me know what you liked about this interview. Or what do you like about custom knives and custom knife making? But at the end, stay safe. And I know, no, no, you're going to really like this. Also, a quick technical note around the 40-minute mark. Sergio's voice, it's clear, but it sounds a little electronic-y, uh, robotic. That happens for about a minute, and that goes away. All right, well, good evening, Sergio. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much, Kevin, for doing this. Ah, thank you. I, as as you know, I have a passion for knives. I don't know a lot about. I just have a I have a passion for craftsmanship and for people doing things with their hands. And we've gone back and forth, and so I'm really, really, really glad that we're getting a chance to speak. And you sent me some little things ahead of time that are gonna, that I'll I'll show people, and also we'll be creating some separate things for it. But your work is fantastic. How did you get into this? And where and where are you located? I live in Bowie, Texas. Bowie. Bowie, Texas, North Texas. I'm about 25 miles uh, south of the Red River. Oh, okay. Uh, great, great area. I get to experience the seasons here, which in Central Texas and West Texas, I never got to see what seasons were like. So you grew up in Central Texas? I grew up in Junction, Texas. Where is Junction, Texas? Junction, Texas is um, right on I-10, uh, west of Kerrville. And it's pretty famous for the Bear Bryant Texas Tech camp where they had the Junction Boys. Okay. So everybody knows Junction for that. And what was that like growing up there? Did you and did you did you ever did you leave to move up north just to get the seasons or did you move up north for work or for like how how did you get on this path? That's what I essentially I am an educator, that's why I'm in Bowie. Okay. And I was lucky enough to get the high school principal job here in Bowie. And oh. it's been a blast being blessed to represent Bowie High School as their leader. Well, that being said, the path of knives has been going for quite some time. Uh, as you can tell, most of my stuff, my handle on Instagram is Mintaka Sensei. And that's because I was a martial arts instructor for quite a few years. Ah. And I was going to make, you know, I started making collecting knives and I, I love all kinds of knives. So I got to the point where I said, you know, I can make this cheaper than I can spending money every month on new knives. So, <laughs> that makes yeah. Sense. So were you, I, like a, were you a teacher first and then do you move up the ranks to become a principal? How does that work? Absolutely. I started, 
I started as a substitute, became a paraprofessional, then a teacher, uh, then an AP, and then uh, finally got my shot at the at the wonderful spot of head principal. So, oh. yeah, it all. Oh wow! And 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 how has that been? Because you still are a principal. How has that been during this time? You know, the the crazy thing is with COVID and being an educator, it shows how much educators value students, how much students miss the social aspect of school. And then just, I I work with some very gifted teachers and just being able to see how, how much they impact a student, you know, on a daily level Mm -hmm. on just letting the kid know that they care. Uh And it's a blessing just to be able to see that. How interesting. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who knew that this, something so awful like this would bring out all these revelations essentially with healthcare workers, with teachers, like how important this is for everyone's life. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of a positive guy, Kevin. You are. No, it's so am I, (laughs) as you can tell, I I hope you get that. This world's too full of negatives. There's so much negative And, and it's, it's a blessing. It's great to talk to you, especially during these times. And that's kind of why I don't, if, I've been doing a lot of these during COVID because I want people to be able to look back and see what people's mindset, what, like what, what they were thinking at the time. And yeah, and you've and you guys, like, we've all kind of made it over this hump. It's not quite there yet. But are you? Are the kids back at school? Kids are back in school. We started school back in August, and we wore masks. We were socially distanced. Oh. Um, <laughs> we were lucky enough to have a kind of progressive school board this past week they voted to not require masks in the school anymore so the kids were very happy about that and we were you know we're we're back rocking and rolling feeling like it's 2019 (laughs) i remember then do you remember 2019 that was such a it's a it's so bizarre i I, it's 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 really strange now with behind you really quick too what kind of trees are that you know what kind of trees those are behind you right those are oak trees those are oaks they're beautiful how beautiful is this is just picturesque (laughs) i know we were doing we were going to try to do it inside but the only problem is i got my neighbor's guard dog barking at me she's she's deaf but she takes care of the property (laughs) it's not too bad it's not like it's like it's a deep bark so it's not like a piercing bark well so so then when you decided okay i'm gonna start making knives what was the first knife you made and how do you go about did you get books on it or do you talk to people or how did you do there there was a lot of conversations with knife makers themselves um with people using knives i was gonna make tactical knives that could be used for self defense for uh, combat and oh. I learned quickly you know when I started on the journey that um, nobody wants to buy those knives <laughs> and nobody's interested in them I, 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 I remember my first tactical buoy and it was a hunk of three pounds it was just huge and I said hey what do you think and the guy was like man I'm not carrying that and I said man, why don't you try it I'll, I'll let you try it for free he goes no you can keep it didn't he couldn't even give them away <laughs> So, so your first knife uh, was a three pound knife. Yeah, it was huge. It's terrible. It's terrible. Do you um, still have it? I, I, I do somewhere. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this, if you find it, I mean, I it's a big away, so yeah, I got it. That and with that being said, I started looking around about things I really enjoyed and the times I really enjoyed with my family. And it was the times that I'm in the backyard cooking and just talking and just having that very familial atmosphere where everybody's accepted and everybody's okay i started to remember that and i'm on instagram so i started uh following this guy who was a great barbecue chef and we'd talk about recipes and stuff like that and it was robert sierra oh wow and robert sierra is ss pit crew Mm -hmm. and i think what got me conversing with him was a recipe for his wife's capirotada Okay. which is a Lent recipe of like a bread pudding kind of thing. Okay. And it looked amazing. And Kevin, if there's one thing you know about me, you know, most people's moms are great cooks. Mine was not the greatest. Let's just say that. There might've been two or three dishes that were great. Not the, not the greatest capirotada maker oh, that's there. So I saw Robert's wife's capirotada and I said, dude, I got to have that recipe. And then we just started talking. And then suddenly I said, you know, I make knives. I'd love to try and make you a 
knife, what could you use? And he goes, well, I need a 14 inch slicer. Okay. I was like a slicer. He goes, yeah, for briskets. And that's how the brisket slicer oh. became. I, I mean, it, it, that's right. There was, we coined the term. I don't know if we coined it, but I hadn't seen it before. And so I made this knife out of an old disc, a plow disc. It, it was, I loved it. It was beautiful and ugly and rough and sharp as hell. And that's what a knife should be to me. And so he, I remember I met him at, uh, well, I don't remember the name of the place, but it was a barbecue joint in San Antonio. He, he liked the knife and I was going to say enamored. He wasn't enamored. He was just like, dude, that's a nice knife. Um, how, how long ago was this? Oh. 20 2015 okay 2015 i think so we did that and once he posted the pics the first picture of it uh i had a few interests and then i said well i'll, I'll see where this goes and it's bloomed from there the people are really good to me and the the interest is there and they understand i'm an educator first so knives take a long time for me to crank out but I think the cool thing is I've grown, they've grown with me. The people who have some of my earlier knives are like, oh man, the stuff you're cranking out now is so different and it's a lot better. And you just grow. It's a progress. Which makes sense because you're passionate about it. But how do you, how do you get all the supplies? Like if, if I was to do, to go into knife making, which most people listen to this art, but like do you, because when you show me the video, like these videos, and not everyone, if you look at what, wait till the end of this, you could see those. And I'm going to do a separate one. You have chemical, you have like chemicals, and you have all these belt senders, and you have all. And then I, I'm assuming you have something to heat up the metal. Like what <laughs> a forge? I guess you have a forge, right? So it's how do you get it? How do you get all that stuff? You accumulate it slowly, or how does that work? Slowly, slow, very slowly. I'm an educator, so I couldn't go out and buy the whole thing. Just and it was like. You know, sometimes I'd save up and buy a tool, but okay. I, I would, you know, it's over time. When I first got into it, my best friend is a farrier. So he knew I was interested in it. And he goes, uh, why don't, I've got an old forge, you want it? And I said, yeah, how much? And he goes, oh, I'll just take it. So he gave me an old forge. I rebuilt wow. the floor and that thing was great. It was an NC, NC tool whisper daddy or something like that okay it, it was great so i used that and up until i moved to Bowie, it, it was great in the move it got it was in the back of the pickup tarped up and somehow we went through a thunderstorm and all that tarp did was gather all the water oh. and put it in that forge oh. so when i unpacked and we dried it out and tried to clear out the lines it just never fired work it never fired again correctly so that was a perfect time for me to get a new forge so and so, uh, so there are there are uh, there's forge companies out there is that absolutely absolutely <laughs> so who, uh, who knew I, I you know the i think the one thing that makes me a little bit different from other knife makers is you will always hear knife makers say stay away from mystery steel because you don't know what it is and i use reclaimed steel okay simply because i'm cheap and I think it is a good thing to not send more product to the landfill. Yeah, definitely. And the steel is good, especially the neat thing about the steel I use is this is very old steel. So the older the steel, I find the better it hardens, the better it produces that knife that's going to be a workhorse. And sense. it's cheap. You know, I often in... I'm given a lot of steel and I love that. You know, that's what people are like, Hey, uh, for Boston's day, no, no secret Santa this year. I had one of my teachers give me a whole bunch of files and she's like, is this okay? I was like, you don't know how happy you made me. Really? This is wonderful. Oh yeah. So, so it's okay. Just, so my brain's going, are you melting down the steel and then you have bulbs or how, what the heck? <laughs> okay. So, Sorry, I, I'm what, just thinking yeah, like Lord of the I, Rings or something. <laughs> what I do is I take the steel and I forge it. I use the hammer to shape it into a knife. Okay. So that steel goes from being an old rasp or an old plow disc gotcha. or an old file 
and I, I, whatever shape it's in, I've learned how to, how to forge flat. I've learned how to forge round. I've learned how to forge square. Interesting. Into a knife shape. So that's the journey is learning how to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really neat. That is really neat. But then how did you learn how to attach it to a handle and your handles are beautiful. And then the one, that one, and then the Osage, uh, uh, there's so many, uh, there's a lot of this. I can't, you, this, what you sent me and what people will see, it'll blow them away. It's really interesting because it's such a unique world and really cool. Yeah. With, with uh, the handles, I remember on Instagram, everybody had these real cool handles and I couldn't get anybody. You know, every time you see them, you're like, okay, well, I'll order one. And that person, oh, sorry, I'm sold out. Oh, sorry, I'm sold out. So there was one guy, Gulf Coast Plains, and he, started selling and i waited and waited i said the next time he's got some of that prickly pear and mesquite i'm jumping on it and it was like every day i'd wake up i checked the phone numerous times and just that i started building the relationship now he's used to me and he knows i'm gonna buy it from him he knows you know that's my thing i, I tell myself i'm not gonna buy wood this month and here i am buying wood he he got me today he's like how about this and i was like well, I'll do this. And then I said, well, we better back off because I, I want to be, you know, I don't want to waste too much money. Would. Anyway, that being said. Uh, oh, that's funny though. It's, so wait, but but do they come, people. do they come shaped like a handle or are you Ooh. shaping them? Or like does, they come square, well, right? Or, or rectangular? They come in squares, rectangles and different thicknesses and different materials. And talking to a lot of knife makers when I first started, hey, how do I attach a handle? How do I get this going? And just make it, learning how to do it. And, and in my way, you know, I, I definitely uh, probably do handles a different way than other people. I'm not as neat as other people would be. But like I say, I, my knives are ugly. They are rough. They're meant to be used. I love how ugly they are. They're in the best way, the word ugly. It's, and it's, and the handles have a uniqueness they're beautiful handles they're not ugly. they're if uh, if ugly if those handles are ugly i don't know what ugly is like, because they're really gorgeous <laughs> you know when i say ugly they're they're not a they're definitely not a production not perfect I mean, not even close they're not perfect and i i love the phrase every defect gets respect I like because it's and, and you know as, as humans you know i i i don't know about you kevin but i am definitely not the same I don't have the same body as I had when I was 18. So, you know, I've, I've learned to grow with age and be happy with who I am in myself. And I definitely think the same concept develops over your blade. That blade should be an extension of the person that's using it. And people are like, that matches that their person's attitude. Mm -hmm. There's, yeah. you were showing like some of the blades you're showing there i'm like i want to buy that one i want to <laughs> like you can <laughs> so I, have, I must have multiple personalities now when you figured out how to do it properly and then you the robert sierra is that when you decided to that because everything you do is is everything custom or you come up with ideas and then you also have custom stuff too right like people come to you for custom so yeah i do take custom orders but a lot of what i do just comes like I'll start with the piece of steel and I'll feel it and I'll say, okay, this is what I think would be good. Perfect. Yeah. And then I start hammering on it, whether it's, whether it's thick or thin, I start hammering on the steel and the steel kind of guides me how far I can stretch the steel. Do I want to stretch it too far? How thin do I want it? And, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes and I think that's the beauty of knife making. It, the, the mistakes are even fun because you you get to learn from them. So yeah, I'm just out here, just learning. Having so, are you, a blast. so do you, you heat it up and then you then you pound it and then heat it? Like is that the process or how? Okay. Yes, sir. You 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 heat to I heat to about a bright yellow, maybe bright orange, not the hay yellow color, bright orange, and then I start pounding on it and shaping, and I take it through different stages to where it's going to form a blade. Now I I tend to really love the the chef blade shape so a lot of my blades turn out like that but there's a lot that don't and i enjoy trying to do other shapes so if someone says hey can you do this well i'll try it you know 
I would give it a try. So yeah. yeah. You have three different anvils, right? Or do you have two? I have two anvils. I have two anvils. Uh, one is a double horn and one is a farrier's anvil. Okay. And I, I use them both. I like the double horn a lot for the size and being able to just pound away at it. And the farrier's anvil is good for shaping and fine work for me. But I, not to say that I couldn't do that on the double horn. I just, I just, I, I'm particular in the way I do things. Yeah. Do the neighbors in that area hear you pounding away at metal? So funny you say that. I have tried my best to quiet my anvil. So both of them. So what I do is I take big magnets and you attach it to the anvil and it stops the ring. Oh. And yeah, and it's not all the way gone. It's not even close, but I, I will, I don't hammer before 9 a.m. <laughs> and I don't hammer after 10 p.m. And I've been right up to 9.59, Kevin. I'm, I'm there and I'm like, okay, three more blows and I can bam 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 and i'm like okay i'm done it's 10 o'clock oh that's funny it's, so it's like it's like the like some play air two people live by airports like there's certain times like they can fly and they can't fly or well that's and it's does it is it satisfying pounding it like is that a, oh my god satisfying? that is my de-stressor if i yeah. have a bad day I, or or just i don't even know if it's a de-stressor i just love doing it so if i'm having a good day i'm going to be forging if I'm having a bad day, I'm going to be forging. And it just, it's therapeutic for me, no matter what. And, and seeing the process to go from something raw, unshaped, that, yeah, that. into something pretty refined, and you know it's going to be a fine piece of cutlery, mm -hmm. that, that just has my attention the whole time. Wow. How long does it take you to make one? Depends on the size of the blade. Okay. And depends, there's, there's, some, there's some days I come out frustrated. And, you know, you hit harder when you're a little bit frustrated. And I, I've hammered out a knife for 40 minutes. Uh, that's a, that's uh, a good amount of time. Knife, I, if, I, if I'm taking a long time, I just want to smooth it out and get a good forge finish. I, I've taken like an hour and 15 minutes on a blade. If it's uh, an integral, which is hammered out of round, mm -hmm. and I got to start with a six-inch hammer, six-pound hammer, Man, that that's that takes a while because man, that hammer just kills your arm. Yeah, that it sounds like it would. Yeah, I'm I'm a wing, I'm a weenie. So <laughs> yeah, that that six pound hammer is like, oh my god, crazy. It's like a it's like Thor's hammer. I say it takes you an hour, hour and fifteen minutes or forty minutes to uh, would then the process of making the hand like in the handle. How long total does it take to make one of your knives? You know, I'm I'm pretty fast. I'm pretty fast, and I don't like to brag. I'm not saying I. I'm bragging or anything, but I can probably get a knife done in four hours tops. Okay. And that's, that's a lot of wait time. So with knife making, you have to learn how to wait for epoxy to harden, how to let glue dry, okay. um, let things set. And then everything else is pretty speedy, but I, I can hammer it out pretty fast. I can grind it within about 10, 15 minutes. And then I heat treat, which is maybe 20, 30 minutes at the most. I do a, I do a differential quench. So when I, what I do is, let's say the quench level of the oil is here. Well, I take the blade and I only quench just the edge. So this top part stays out of the oil uh -huh. and is still red hot. Well, the part underneath is under, has already reached under 400 degrees very rapidly. So when that happens, I will take that out and I will watch the colors run. The, the, the steel turns colors ah, yes. and it tells you what, it, what it's doing. So I'll watch the colors run back into the blade. And when I get that purplish color, there's a purple color. That means I'm right at that tempering temperature. And I, I kind of control that going a little bit back into the oil out. And I, and I straighten oh, if there's any defects. It's just a process, and it's just that's so neat. So much the reason fun. I do that is because, yeah, it, it's fun. But then I don't have to temper the blades in an oven. Mm -hmm. You know, the tempering cycle takes probably, you know, I'll, I'll heat treat, then I'll set it down and let it cool to room temp. So that takes some time to cool down. I don't rush the cooling process, and I just let the blade naturally cool once it's quenched. 
and, and I see the colors go into the blade. One of the coolest things about heat treating, let me tell you this, cool. is uh, I think it's called recalescence. And recalescence is a sciencey term for this red rainbow. You know, it's it's red hot, and then it starts cooling down, and you see a black shadow coming through, and then you see this little red ribbon coming through with it, and that's that steel hardening up and turning from the molecules are actually changing right mm -hmm. there. They're changing their how packed they are in the blade. So I do that and then I, that's called thermocycling i do that several times and then i quench when i well, after that and then you know let it cool so i, I had to back up there and tell you about the recalescence that's yeah, one well, of my coolest that is so cool and then but have you along this like journey to to where you are right now did could did you mess up knives or is that something that is that even something possible that you could ruin a knife or you just have to go back and reforge it or Oh, you can ruin a knife. Um, okay. I've had to retemper other knives. I mean, yeah, you like I said, lots of mistakes. Mm -hmm. Most of the mistakes don't get put on Instagram, <laughs> don't get broadcast to the public. Some do because mm -hmm. some mistakes are so groundbreaking to me that through the mistake, there's a huge positive that I want to showcase. Case in point, there was a rasp blade that I was making for a guy who's ordered some knives. And I said, you know, this is the shape he's asking for. And I said, well, I'll try a water quench with this rasp and get a really good hormone line on there. And I did, and everything was going right. No cracking sounds. I was like, dude, I pulled it off. And the hormone was amazing. It was just gorgeous. And then through cleaning up and looking at it, I had cracked the blade. Oh. And oh, this killed me. But that one got posted on Instagram. Was it because it the, cooled too uh, quickly? I don't know what it was. Does the time of year atmospherically matter for what you're doing or you're controlling I don't everything? Think so. I know I, so I forge outside, you know, I have no cover over me when I'm forging. So time of year does matter for me because I'm not, I can't go out when it's raining. Yeah. And I can't go out when it's snowing. Although I did during snow catastrophe this year just i was i was tired of being in the house so i had to get out i enjoyed going out and forging in the snow this year but other than that no temperature outside really doesn't matter oh, well let's i want to talk about what you offer how did you what how, the name came from what texas sage forge yeah so i love ceniso plants okay that's the texas sage okay and uh, you know i didn't want to name it ceniso forge <laughs> No. So I want to name it something that everybody would realize. I love the plant. And I don't know, a, a lot of people know this, but, you know, they bloom before it rains. And it, it turns this beautiful purple. And I don't know one single person who says, oh, I hate that light green, that purple. I, I think every Texan loves those colors. And I said, you know, I want something that people can really get behind and like and so i i definitely took that in consider into consideration and that's where texas forge came, texas sage forge came from and what does what does yeah. texas mean to you oh my god it's everything i i am very proud of being a texan i'm very proud of my heritage my culture everything i was raised around and just being able to be part of Texas is something huge. I, I recently learned like two or three years ago that my last name was named after a general who had fought in the Alamo. Alamo. Wow. And just, I mean, stuff like that just is too cool. So mm -hmm. I've always been intrigued with the state of Texas and the Texas history and little things that, you know, and, and, and to give you an example, in Texas history, I think everybody had to go through seventh, eighth grade, Texas history, one of those. In my Texas history class, we were taught that Santa Ana was killed by this creek. And I can't remember where it was after some battle, but he wasn't. And I recently learned he wasn't. He only had one leg. And the, <laughs> the, the Texans, like, kept the leg. It's in the Smithsonian. What? 
Really? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Um, it was like, what? The, but the Mexican general's flag was, uh, in the, it's in the Smithsonian, and he was actually taken to meet the president at the time in Washington, D.C. And it's just stuff you don't learn in history books. Yeah. So anything Texas, I'm about. I love it. And Texas, mm-hmm. has, it's like its own country. It has, there's so yes. many, it's so diverse. It's so large. The history is so rich and so deep. And the, and the people have, and I, I lived in Texas for a year. I'm from California, but I feel like my soul and my heart is in Texas. And, but it's, it's, there's something special about Texas. And I was trying to, I, maybe that's, maybe that's my quest with these is trying to figure this out. I don't know. And you know, the crazy thing is I love all geographies in Texas. I love East Texas, West Texas. I, Terlingua, Texas is an amazing place to me. I, it just calls my soul. Oh, okay. And then North Texas, South Texas, it, it's just great. So what I do is I try and get steel that is from the land, has worked the Texas land. You know, my saw blades come from an East Texas sawmill that was ran in the early 1920s okay wow. and just this old guy uh i i don't know if the father worked there or grandfather worked there or owned it but he goes yeah this is where it was and i got these saw blades you want them so i paid for those things and okay. again huge saw blade you know 26 22 inches i can get 10 12 knives out of those and i've got like i probably got six more blades the, the is, whole blade because that's what i was getting at like when you in one of the videos that you sent me you talked about how important it was to get like the wood from the like the handle everything everything from the land from texas so one of the things i really like doing and a lot of people will bring me the steel they'll say hey i found this piece of plow on my dad's ranch it was just in the ground so we don't know how long it's been there so this thing is rusted and just torn up and and I'm not saying this thing as in one knife, this happens often, but this piece of steel will be pitted and rusted and ugly. And I'll say, okay, let me see it. And I will shape that into a new knife. And that steel has been in the Texas ground, shape the actual state, produce something off of the land. And now it's gonna be a, a cutler, a piece of cutlery that's oh, going wow. to last another lifetime. And and one of the other things I do is I seek out Texas wood to to get so the tree, that product, and the steel all has Texas soil in it. And I just think the history behind that is just it, it blows my mind when you start thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it blows my mind too. And when you were saying it, it really resonated with me it really touched me because i felt like that that shows it's not just they're not just putting something together it's actually there's uh, there's a lot of thought and passion and and it it's deliberate what you're doing yeah i i have found that you know people will hear that and they'll be like hey let's try this the the one of the coolest pieces that i uh did was a wrench and it was an old wrench wow And, and the guy said, he goes, I know it's at least 150 years old, but I took that and I, I said, you sure you want to turn it into a knife? I'd keep it as a wrench. He goes, no, no. So it was three fourths of an inch thick. And man, I, I hammered that thing forever, but turned it into an eight inch shaft. And my so, God, it, it was a beast. Oh. But so please, I mean, when you hand that over to that person, that's their great grandfather's mm-hmm. wrench turned into a knife that they're going to keep. How special is that? So special. That's you know? beyond special. That's amazing. And when you, hand, when you hand them that blade for the first time and they realize that their grandfather, great-grandfather, used that steel and now it's part of them, you can't, you can't put a price on that. No, you can't. Oh. And, and oh, they just dig it. And It's, I, mag- I it's magical, that. actually. You've created like a, it's, you're passing down memories and it's yeah. imbe- embedded in that ah sti- uh, oh, that's it's amazing i want to before i get uh, off of the wo- the weeds what do you offer like so people can know i know you have your instagram but what what types of things do you like to to build i like i like chef knives chef because the reason i like chef knives is because it brings people together 
I think God was kind of telling me in a way, you know, fighting isn't the way. Everybody wants to belong. Everybody wants to feel part of something. Mm -hmm. And that familial backyard barbecue, the mother, grandmother, father, whoever it is, cooking a meal for their family has some magic in it. And that is what I try and capture. Is the best way to, because on your website, you have some, some uh, photos, but then it, the, is Instagram the best way to see what you offer? And then are you releasing knives just kind of haphazardly or do you have like a schedule that you do or how, like, how does that work for people? If they want to, <laughs> you know, it's not, not that it has to be anyway. <laughs> I think it's random is probably better, but. So here, here's what I said. I, I do have the caveat. I do remind people I'm a high school principal. Yes. I never know what my day is going to look like when I go into it. And I don't know how much time I'm going to get during the day or in the evening. And there have been times I have been forging and had to stop because um, the kids need my help or something calls me away. Yeah. That is what I work around. And I, I don't, I don't feel bad about that. I don't apologize for that. But people need to understand if they want something from me, they're probably going to have to wait a little bit. Okay. And when people say, hey, I need it in two weeks. Well, hey, go somewhere else. There's tons of great knife makers out there. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the guy that's going to be able to do something, crank something out in two weeks. So what would you um, say? What's a good time frame then? What's a safe one that you feel comfortable with? I say between two to four months. Okay. And that's right now. I am trying to finish my doctorate. So wow. yeah, good for you. trying to get that trying to get my dissertation finished. I'm about to start my chapter four and really start writing. So that will impact the knife making as well. Okay. But, you know, it's always about improvement, improvement in what you're doing and your journey to where you're going. And I, I think the doctorate is part of something that I, I have to get done. That's, that's huge. That's a big, big deal. But if, but you also are, don't you have, do you have any backstock at all in knives or do you have knives that you've made not for anybody that you just put online? I do. Okay. I do. Currently I have just a few, okay. but I will list them in Instagram and people can go and look and let me know what they think. And I try not to list prices because I don't want to, you know, one of the things Kevin that I, I really do is I can make a knife for anybody's budget. And so you tell me, and if that passion is there for that person, I'm going to make them that knife. Now, I can make an expensive knife. I, I would much rather make the knife that that person wants. So if it takes them hearing about the inexpensive knife and going for that, I'm okay doing that. If they want to really do something spectacular and push the price up, they can do that too. But my thing is, I want that person to really feel good about their purchase and their blade. So that, that's the main thing. Am I taking care of the people? Uh, more so? Do you like to get feedback later on from people? I'm sure it does feel good. I said, absolutely. Uh, I really like the best when people send me pictures of them using the knife to cook or around the, not around, not like around the family. You know, when they're using it to cook a meal and with the product of the meal, and it just it warms my heart because I know that they're enjoying the blade that I made for them to use. Definitely. Ah, oh, that's that's so neat. What are the what are all the best ways? So then what are the best ways for people to get a hold of you? Instagram, they can call me. I always put up my phone number. So my phone number is 432 638 And I, I'm very direct. So not, not like a jerk direct, but if I'm busy, I'll, I'll call and say, hey, can't talk right now, I'll call you right back, or I'll call you in an hour, I'll call you in two hours. Uh, so, you know, I, I do that, but I, I definitely, to me, the blessing in knife making is getting to meet a lot of people and to hear their stories of what they want from the knife, and, you know, like, like the knife from the wrench, knowing that story. I have made knives where... A guy from South Texas has sent me wood called Ebonito. And Ebonito is this hard ebony wood that is right around South Texas. And I mean, it is tough. But the cool thing about that wood, that wood, is when you get done with it, it polishes so nicely. And it looks like the way a cottontail or a coyote or a jackrabbit's fur looks in the wild. Wow. 
is just amazing. And that there's yellows and grays and blacks and they pop. And, oh, it's just beautiful. It's called Ebonito? Um, that's what a lot of people call it. Uh, I, I, I don't know, really. Uh, I think it's just Ebony. It's not Texas yeah. Ebony. Interesting. That being said, I do have uh, a family that has supported me. Uh, I think the son, the last name is Schuler. The son bought one of my first knives. And this was, man, they were rough, Kevin. <laughs> they were just rough and ugly. And uh, he bought one of my first knives. And then his dad kind of got into ordering knives for me. And they, I think they have the most Texas Sage Forge knives together. They have like a collection. Really? Yeah. They're, they're smart <laughs> because they're so beautiful. That's, I, I hope that someday, 10 years from now, I can look back and have a, a collection of your knives too because it's, it's really, really special. It's, and, and, and I'm not necessarily going to put this part in there, but I, I would like to, when I'm able to travel and I'd like to, I'd like to film you and talk to you while you forge a knife. I think that would be so interesting for people to see. You got to come forge a knife with me. I would love to. I would love yeah. to. Yeah. That would be, um, that would be amazing. One, one of those knives that they, they keep showing that, that family is a knife I made out of a break drum disc or a break disc that I found in a parking lot here in the high school parking lot. I was walking, I said, look at that piece of steel. And just, I don't know, something called me to it most of the time. I would have thrown it away. That one, it just called me. And I, so I hammered it out, tested the steel, and uh, made sure it was hardenable. And then I forced the blade out of it. And I have a break drum? It was awesome, yeah. When, when I say hammer it out and test the steel, so what you do to make, what I do to make sure a steel will keep an edge is I hammer it super, super thin, just a small part, super, super thin. I quench in water, which makes it very, very brittle, and then I'll hit it with the hammer. And if it shatters like glass, it's hardenable. Oh, interesting. If it doesn't, if it, if it bends... It's not hard. Huh. And what would, would there be another metal in there that would cause it to not be hardenable? It's the carbon content. Oh, the carbon content. Yeah, you have mild steel and then you have carbon steel. Carbon steel has carbon in it. What's preferable? Less carbon? Mild steel is unhardenable. You can't harden mild steel. I think there's a process where you can carbonize steel, but I'm not that scientific. I don't, I'm, I'm barely Point by in chemistry and physics in high school. So I'm not going to carbonize steel. So what are you getting your dissertation in? Educational leadership. Uh, okay, okay. So do you want to be like, do you want to run a, like a school district? Is that like the next step? That's on my goal. Okay. You know, With superintendent. That, superintendent, that's what, okay. I, I, sorry. I, I don't know all the terms, but I, I know that it's like, I, I assume that that would be like the next step. And that would be, would that be in Bowie or was it? Not in the near future. <laughs> I have a great boss. He supports my knife making. And <laughs> he might, he the might see this. I make. He's a great boss. His name is Blake Inlow and just such a top-notch educator and has taught me a lot about caring about people and how to truly lead for the children. You know, every yeah. decision we make is for kids. And I wish I could say that's the case in all districts, mm -hmm. but in yeah. this district, it really is. And that. Oh man, I can't tell you. It has changed my outlook on education. Do your students know you make knives? Some do. Some do. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I'll be walking through and they're like, hey, make me a knife. And I'm like, hey, you haven't paid me yet. And <laughs> you know, we, we joke. We joke a lot. Some of my students will bring me steel. I moved from Bandera, Texas, and there was a guy and he'd bring me steel. His name is Kinley. And he brought me a whole truck spring. And yeah, just that's cool. Just good people. Yeah, that's really interesting. Is there anything that we miss that you want people to know about what you do or what you offer? It's two to four months is what you're looking at. And if someone sees something online that they like, they could say, "Hey, I like this. I want something similar." Right? Is that kind of how people? Yeah. Okay. 
And that happens a lot. And uh, I'll have people draw crazy draw diagrams. They're like, hey, I want this. And okay. like, hey, man, I can't make that. Yeah. Have you ever made a sword? Well, some of the brisket knives are the size of swords. Yeah, I guess they would be, right? Yeah. But no, I have not made a sword. I, I really think there is something to that speaks to me about blades that have a purpose in helping and aiding humanity. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there, that's something completely different that would be for sure. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. And then with, is that, is Chopzilla that Chopzilla, is that something you're selling or is that something you keep? Chopzilla is available right now. That one is. <laughs> it's really cool. I try, every, every blade that I make, I go through this process of when I'm making it. If I don't like it, it doesn't get made. But every blade, I'm like, ooh, I might keep this one. Every single blade, I'm like, ooh, I might keep this one. It's a good sign. And yeah. And, and it ends up where what's funny is I don't cook with one of my own knives because I usually sell them. Oh, you need to have one, <laughs> don't you? You shouldn't cook with one. I, I've got three right now that I have managed to keep to myself. And I will use them to cook every now and then when I do cook, let's just say that. Yeah, yeah. But the, it, it just happens. You know, I'm, I'm there and I found a good place for steel in Deleon, Texas. And I was going through, found it. And the guy who had the steel place, he owned the tractor store. He goes, oh, man, you can have it. And I just didn't feel right giving, just taking the steel. So in my, in my pocket, I had one of my knives. And I said, here, why don't you take this? And he goes, what? And I said, yeah, I can make another. So, that's so cool. That's really neat. That's that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Now, what is your, you said in one of the videos that your daughter shares a studio. What kind of art does she, what does she do? With All right. She's, a, she's an art student at uh, Midwestern State University in Wichita Falls. And my daughter, Nadia, is, she'll come in and she will use everything that I have to complete art. So there's sculpture, there's. Oh, right now she's in sculptures. So she was working on a wood project this past week. She's fixing to go into metal sculpture. That's great. I'm, that's... Sure, I'm sure she's ready to use the forge with that one. So wow. that's neat. Yeah. That's and I wonder. You wonder if she would have been interested in it if it wasn't for you doing this. I don't know. Yeah, I was maybe. an art major in college myself. I don't want to say that I encourage her to do to go the art mm -hmm. route, but. Uh, I, I do think she enjoys watching the process and me go through the process of knife making, of creating things. Do you know how many knives you've made, roughly? Do you have any idea? I always try and think back. At this point, I'd say at least over 150. Right. I would think so, yeah. I would think at least 150. I'm sure I've, I probably have personally seen at least 25 or 30, I think. So I guess <laughs> maybe oh. more. And that's the thing, you know, I'll, I'll have a break where I'm really after it and I'll make 40 knives in a week. And then there's a break like Snowtastrophe where I make like no knives <laughs> and, and, you know, I'll forge it out, but I don't complete them. The <laughs> problem I have with, with knife making, the one thing I do that I've got to get better at is I will start forging. And before I know it, I've forged 20, 25 blades. And then I'm like, okay, now I got to stop forging. Yeah, makes and sense. finish them and that gets tough for me to do because i'll wake up with a knife idea in my head and i'm like i've got to try this shape i've got to <laughs> so you have make this. yeah, yeah. And, well, or i'll watch a video and they're using a knife shape i'm like well i'm making that knife tomorrow <laughs> no it makes sense like it's a lot of i think that's i think that's a human nature is to start a lot of stuff and then it's the completion yeah. that really is that's the final step that a lot of people never get to that in in most things that they do so it's you you get so excited and pumped up about a lot of stuff and I, you do obviously for forging and then you have to finish your dives i i, I gotta tell you one thing that i definitely want to mention is mark at convenience west barbecue and marfa man i cannot tell you the support he's given me i think he's just an, a great human being during covid times they were giving food out to people. They were doing everything they could. He was losing money on the daily and he kept giving wow. and just gave and gave and gave. And the moment he and I started talking, 
I knew he was a little bit different. He ordered a knife from me and he goes, uh, this is what I want. And I said, it's going to take this much time. He goes, no rush. And I think he's got two or three of my knives, maybe even four. Is that how we connected? But, uh, Did we connect with him? Yes. I think so. Yes. Okay. So him being out in Marfa, Marfa is a town that's right close to Alpine. I went to school in Alpine. Oh. Met my wife in Marfa. So I was, I was so thrilled to hear that a barbecue place was opening up in Marfa. And then being able to say, you know, hey, let me make a knife for you. I know that, that and I just feel so connected to West Texas. It, it, it makes me feel good that my knives are in Marfa. And I know that some of my knives are in Marathon at the Gage and at Brick Vault, Brick Vault Brewery. It makes me feel good that they're there. All, every place that my knives are at and every person they're attached to, I really try and thank and just, I, I feel honored that they would even consider using my knives. I know uh, Miguel Vidal from Valentina's Tex-Mex Barbecue. He owns some of my knives. And when I first showed him, I remember he goes, what are these black marks in the steel? I said, those are hammer marks. Hammer marks. That, that's where that hammer comes down. And he's like, oh, so you're no, you're not joking. You made this. I go, yes, sir, I did. And that's what uh, when I you were in some of the videos that you sent me, when you could see those hammer marks, those are great. And that's that's that <laughs> ugliness. That's the ugliness you're yes. referring to. Yeah, yeah. I try. I'm trying to get better to smooth them out. But there are tons of people who love those things. So oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, def- and they'll ask, hey, can you put hammer marks in it? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> No, uh, I do get the other people who are like, hey, I want the knife to look exactly like this. And will send me a picture of like a production knife. And I'm like, you know, my knives don't look like that. If mm-hmm. that's what you want, go to Walmart and they sell great knives. Yeah. But yeah, most people, most of my clientele really love the the hammered look and the, the, the rough look. Yeah. And it's handmade by you. And that's what by makes me. it special. That's what that's that's what that's that's what i would appreciate from having that and that's that's so neat to hear about them too i love those are two people those places brick fault and uh convenience west are both places that i i really want to talk to and i really want to visit because i being out the outskirts so to speak it's just so and having the passion and trying to bring it to where they are i I love that i love and the fact that you said that he was so nice and so kind and he was the one who said, yeah, hey, you should, we should connect. So it's, that's great. That's really neat to hear. I appreciate that. Yeah. And it's, and this has been, this has been really, really informative. And if, if you're watching this, I want people to know if they're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to have at the end of this inf- uh, videos from you that you've sent me, as well as I'm going to have a companion video that'll just be what you sent me and I'll edit it and make it a flow, make it flow, but it'll be nice for people because then they can learn more about you. You also teach about um, what you're doing, the different tools that you use, and then you also show how to sharpen your knife. And it, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's just all, it's, to me, it's all, it's a world that I love. And I, I appreciate you taking the time, especially in such an idyllic setting behind you. Just, it's, dude, this is so great. I really, and you're a kind guy. I, I appreciate, and we've corresponded. So it's nice to have finally met you in person thank you and i can't thank you enough i i really appreciate it my my family appreciates it well let's uh let's let's hope let's hope this get, at least opens a few people's eyes to what you do i i hope so it's you you know it's it's that little incremental you know not everyone's yeah. gonna want not everyone's gonna want your knives and not everyone's gonna like what i do or at least gotta connect with whoever we can and you know doing doing what i do i have learned that there there will always be naysayers so i'm not here for the naysayers no i'm here for the positive people i'm i'm just on my journey mm-hmm. and i'm gonna yeah. make not so yeah. well, excellent well it's so great to meet you i hope you have a great rest of your day all right man all Thank right, have, you. A, have a good one take care you too. Bye. Bye. this what i try and do is i take try and take steel and i try and make it into the best cutting area that i can to to have it make it have the best feel when it goes through medium when i say medium whether it be meat or veg it's going to go through it and this one is just phenomenal when you the the slice is just effortless 
I really dig these blades and I, I, I'm very pleased with the geometry and how easily they go through medium. Hello, my name is Sergio Menchaca. I make knives. I make knives from reclaimed steel and I forge every blade that I make. It has been a journey to learn how to make knives and to begin making knives that somebody appreciated. So thank you for your interest and here's some of what I do. These are some blanks from Gulf Coast Blanks that just came in today. The way I get them is this. Look at that. That's just beautiful. I'm not a shiny guy, so this will probably be attached with the dull side. And then this will be ground away to where it is a matte finish. As you can see, most of my blades, yeah, they do look very, I, I think they look awesome. But the handles are just a part of them. I believe that when you take a piece of wood and a piece of steel from the area that has been laying on the ground or on a farm for, let's say, 60 to 100 and something years, then you take it and shape it into a usable tool and you put it, pair it with wood from the area. I don't know if I can get that to be seen, but I think that is the purest form of a knife that you can get and just it's part of the land it's part of the history and it's just an amazing tool i do use a lot of old stuff there's some pecan right there some different handles more handles up here i have a lot of handles and this is wood on the this is pecan that's oak i use old pizza boxes as my cutting area more handles this is curly maple some maple <laughs> and then oak uh, those are specialized handles and osage orange just amazing so i was given a plow tine over a year and something ago and i have just been waiting to do something with it well i forged it out pretty thin into what i call the tomatero and just a really thin, fun little chef's blade, little slicer. It's about seven inches long with an Osage orange handle. Just light and quick as the Dickens. It's going to slice what you need. And it's got a pretty pronounced hamon on it. This is one of those blades that I'm just very proud of. Just because it's such a cool little fit. This is Chopzilla. Chopzilla was originally designed for Robert Sierra. Robert has a much bigger Chopzilla. But this is Chopzilla. It comes, it is made from a plow blade. And it comes, you can see it's got so much character in it. But it is 3 16 3 inch thick and it's a great chopper, uh, dressed in lacy sycamore from Gulf Coast Blanks. Amazing wood, amazing feel. Everybody asks about this one. This one is the cleaver or clip point cleaver that everybody asks for. Okay, so some of y'all who know me, I really love the state of Texas and I try and get blades that have more of the state of texas most of my steel is from texas i do have steel that's from other places if people ask for certain steels i try and accommodate but most of the time the steel is from texas so that being said this blade is prickly pear fiber in resin and that looks like some muscadine grape wood right there it is dressed on a Probably a seven, six to seven inch chef, but as you can see, those are hammer marks that was hammered out out of hot steel. So this is what I do. This is a Osage Orange Nakiri. This blade has is very indicative of what I do. So everything I do, if it's imperfect, that's because I shake a lot. I, I'm old. And I shake a lot. 
This one has one of the best handles I've ever made. It just feels great in the hand, but it is very asymmetrical. So it's not the production piece that everybody can buy at the store. This is something that is special for, going to be for somebody. So, uh, yeah, one of those very close to the Texas Earth uh, pieces. The, the rasp, I get my rasp from a North Texas farrier who works in North Texas. His rasps are very good steel, and I depend, I have many of my knives that are made out of that steel. So this is my shop. You'll see I use a lot of old boxes, old containers to hold things. Um, here are some knives that are finished and waiting to be shipped out or waiting to be purchased. This is where I put on handles. I share the space with my daughter who's an artist. So she uses the same, pretty much the same stuff I do. Here's a small grinder. I keep a collection of old boxes so that I can make sheaths and quick sheaths to send and ship knives out. Here's some firewood that we needed during our snow catastrophe. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the main machine, the workhorse, the Maribraid 2x72 grinder. I nicknamed this one Joan Crawford because she's mean. This is my smaller grinder that I use to grind handles. It doesn't have an, as an aggressive as aggressive motor to it, so um, I do use that one a lot. This is my main anvil. This is my secondary anvil. My quench area. And uh, my photo stump that I use to take pictures on. I have a lot of steel over here that's waiting to be used. I have some plow disc cut up, ready to be used there. These are some tongs that I use, and this is where I use my ferric chloride, and Danish oil, and um, baking soda bath with Windex neutralizes that base these are some handles that just came in today gulf coast blanks have you ever wondered how to uh, sharpen a knife this is what i use most of the time sorry i'm trying to adjust to the camera this is one of my chef's knives a little slicer i say a little it's about eight and a hair over eight inches long but so i would take this blade and put it down here and guide this upward. I start with the gray end. This is a buffing compound on the strop. Do this motion. Notice I'm going, I'm not acting like I'm cutting the strop. I'm going with the blade, with the edge right here. And this, I have found, produces a razor sharp edge very quickly. I love carbon steel because if I'm in the field and it gets dull, I can sharpen on a piece of concrete if I need to. I can then later work and get it back to that razor edge. But carbon steel takes a good edge and a fast edge. That's why I choose to work with carbon steel. So when I say I don't make shiny knives and my knives are ugly, what I'm Portraying is the fact that most of the time my knives do not see a higher grit than 120. With that being said, you're not going to get a mirror polish with my blades. You're not going to get the real silvery, shiny knife. I do love how when I edge quench the blade, the natural hamon in that carbon steel pops out with just a little bit of ferric chloride and then you wipe it off and it stays there for the life of the knife. That use and the patina that is formed on a carbon steel blade to me are the, the beauties of using a carbon steel blade. You're going to pull out a knife that has indicators of its use, of its life, of its past life, and just 
people are going to say, man, tell me about that blade. That looks amazing. 